My name is Rachel Frank, and I'm a sports medicine and shoulder surgeon, as well as the director of the Joint Preservation Program at the University of Colorado in Denver. And today we will be discussing joint preservation with the IOBP procedure. When we think about bone marrow edema reactions or bone marrow edema-like reactions within the knee, we know based on the literature as well as our own clinical practice that these are very common. Looking at these two studies presented here, we can see that bone marrow lesions within the knee are reported in anywhere between 48% and 62% of patients undergoing knee MRIs. What we have to determine as surgeons is, do all bone marrow edema-like reactions or lesions require treatment? Well, here we're going to present the case of a patient who had a symptomatic bone marrow edema-like reaction and underwent an appropriate treatment in a joint preserving approach. So this is our patient. He's a 55-year-old male and an avid runner. He presented with acute, sharp, right lateral knee pain, and he localized that to the proximal tibia. He failed injections at another treatment facility and presented to our office. On physical examination, he presented relatively healthy. In fact, he looked physiologically much younger than his chronologic age of 55. His BMI was 22. He was in neutral gross alignment. He had a trace effusion in the involved knee associated with lateral joint line tenderness to palpation. When we look at his imaging studies, we can see that his alignment was in fact neutral and he has no significant joint space narrowing consistent with arthritis. In other words, this is a healthy knee. When we look at this MRI finding, we can see here that he does have a bone marrow edema-like reaction within the proximal aspect of the lateral tibia just along the subchondral surface. There's also some lateral meniscus tearing that we can see on subsequent MRI findings. In this case, we talked to him about a variety of options. He's already tried and failed injections by another facility, and he has simply not been able to get back to his active lifestyle, including running. He's quite debilitated by his knee pain, and he wishes for a definitive solution. His radiographs and MRI findings do not suggest that he's ready for anything such as a joint replacement or a realignment osteotomy, and so we have to think about what's causing his pain and what joint preserving solutions do we have. So in this case, we talk about offering him a knee arthroscopy with debridement of the meniscus as needed, as well as the IOBP procedure or intraosseous bioplasty procedure involving core decompression of that bone marrow edema-like reaction in the proximal lateral tibia, as well as direct application of concentrated PRP. What is IOBP or the IOBP procedure? This involves a core decompression of the symptomatic area within the bone. It can be done not only in the proximal tibia, as we'll demonstrate here, but also in the distal femur, as well as in the hip, as well as in the humerus, and a variety of other bones. In these cases, we drill the lesion with a pin, and then we retro-drill that lesion so that we create a core, or essentially decompressing that lesion. We use fluoroscopy intraoperatively to help guide where we're placing the pin and the reamer, and we can use the scope to help ensure that we don't violate the articular surface. And then after we've done our core decompression of the lesion, we can apply a biologic as well as bone graft to backfill that area, in this case concentrated PRP as well as DBM. In this case, we take the patient for an arthroscopy, partial lateral meniscectomy, and core decompression using the IOBP procedure with biologic augmentation. We begin with the bone marrow aspiration. We withdraw 60 cc's of bone marrow from the proximal anteromedial tibia. You could also do this from the iliac crest if you prefer, but I prefer the proximal tibia for ease in cases involving knee surgery. We then process the aspirated bone marrow in the angel centrifuge machine to create concentrated PRP. We then use that on the back table to create our mixture for backfilling the core decompressed lesion. Here we're mixing the PRP with DBM, and the goal is for a putty-like consistency. We want something that will be easily able to be pushed through the syringe into the lesion, but not so liquid-like that it will spill back out. So we're really looking for a putty-like consistency, and we go back and forth a few times until we get it just right, and then we fill our smaller syringes with this mixture on the back table. Next, we turn our attention back to the knee and we localize the lesion based on our MRI findings using both arthroscopy as well as intraoperative fluoroscopy, as you can see here, using multiple planes to ensure that we're in the right spot. We then, after placing our guide pin, we insert the delivery cannula and then we'll decompress the lesion. This is performing the core decompression using the reamer. And in this case, we want to avoid going into the joint and that's where the scope can be really helpful. 
We remove the inner stylet, as you can see here, and then we'll go ahead and use those pre-filled syringes that we already made on the back table to fill the lesion that we've just decompressed. We can use a mallet to gently impact the biologic mixture, but we want to be careful to not violate the articular surface. Because of the putty-like consistency, we know that that mixture will stay nice and in the defect site itself versus spilling back out of the hole once the trocar is removed. This concludes the procedure. After this procedure, the patient's allowed to be weight-bearing as tolerated, although most patients will use crutches for a few days due to discomfort, and they have range of motion as tolerated with full return to activities expected at around three to four months after surgery. Thank you very much.